Hi, physiology students, and welcome to part two of our digestive system study. This is chapter 22. It's a lot of review of just basic anatomy of your digestive system. Um, we're working our way down and we're in the small intestine. A little bit of the gross anatomy is described here. One thing you should know is that your small intestine is the major organ of digestion and absorption. So this is where we have everything. Um, juices from the pancreas, juices from the liver, the bile being kind of put into the small intestine to help with digestion, the breaking down of food, and also absorption, which is moving those small food molecules into the circulatory system to be taken to the liver for processing. If you remember, the small intestine has a much smaller diameter than the, than the large intestine, but it's actually much longer than the large intestine. Here are divisions of the um, subdivisions of the small intestine that you should know, the duodenum, jejunum, and the ileum, as highlighted and shown there. And here's a look at where the juices from the pancreatic duct and bile from the common bile duct will enter through this hepatopancreatic ampulla to bring all those digested juices and fluids for digesting fats, proteins, everything into the duodenum. It has its own blood supply by the superior mesenteric artery. Its nervous supply is uh, by the vagus nerve, parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest division. Here are some modifications for the small intestine. They're, they have the inner side of the small intestine has circular folds, villi and microvilli, and these all help with digestion and absorption. And we'll go through some of that now. So this is a look at some of the modifications of the epithelium of the inside of the small intestine. You can see the villi covered with tiny microvilli in the circular folds. A picture like this you might see on your lecture exam um, labeling the villi. Within the villi, we have the green lacteal, which absorbs lipids or fats into the lymphatic system. We see each villi has blood vessels, which will carry absorb nutrients to the liver. Um, so you should know well and be able to um, uh, label a picture like this for your lecture exam. The histology of the intestinal wall, the different types of um, cells we have, we have enterocytes. Um, they're simple columnar cells. They help to absorb nutrients and electrolytes. There's a crypts, which are kind of like divots between the villi that help to produce intestinal juices. Goblet cells secrete mucus. Enteroendocrine cell is a source of enterogastrums, which are some of our hormones required for digestion. And I don't ask you too many questions about that. Uh, Panath cells will secrete antimicrobial agents that can destroy bacteria. And stem cells will continually divide um, to just replace the other cells. More histology of the intestinal wall. We have lymphoid follicles, um, Peyer's patches, all a part of the lymphoid system to try to um, fight off bacteria. Duodenal glands will secrete an alkaline mucus to try to neutralize acidic kind that's coming from your stomach. Um, and when we talk about a homeostatic imbalance of cells, chemotherapy, for example, targets all types of cells, hopefully cancer cells within that, but it can also kill off normal healthy cells when it does that. And that also targets rapidly dividing GI tract epithelium with those stem cells. So this is why the reason why many patients undergoing chemo are constantly nauseous, vomiting, and may have diarrhea. I'm sorry, I keep sniffing. Um, with my pregnancy, I always get um, just really congested. So I apologize for that. About one to two liters is secreted daily in response to distension or irritation of mucus. So this is the intestinal juices. And the major stimulus for, produ for production of this juice is hypertonic or acidic kind. So basically what this juice is, it's just an alkaline or basic juice try trying to kind of counteract the acidity of anything coming in from the stomach. All right, this is a good, this in general, I think these two tables are really good for just describing an overview of the functions of the organs in the GI tract from the mouth down to the large intestine. So use kind of those two slides to review that. Then in the large intestine, here are some three major features that I'll let you review from anatomy. The subdivisions, the appendix, um, the appendix is kind of the bacterial storehouse capable of recolonizing the gut bacteria when necessary. It's a part of the malt um, of the immune system, which helps to fight off bacteria. 
and it has a twisted shape which makes it susceptible to blockages and we'll talk more about appendix in a little bit. Then the colon has these regions which you should review and then we end with the rectum and then you have three rectal valves which stop feces from being passed um, when there's gas or flatus. And then the anal canal is the last segment of large intestine. It has two sphincters. Um, the internal anal sphincter is made up of smooth muscle, which is involuntarily controlled. But then what we can control when we bear down and have a bowel movement is the external anal sphincter, which is made of skeletal muscle. So this is the anatomy of the large intestine that you should review as well. Um, the large intestine to the peritoneum, this just describes how the cecum, appendix, and rectum are all retroperitoneal, so they lie on the back of that abdominal wall cavity. Um, as shown a, a little bit here, you kind of see the greater omentum, which is this apron-like structure that holds all the intestines in place. And you can see you can't really see much of the large intestine yet because it's kind of behind everything else, and that's retroperitoneal. So here we have, now we see the large intestine with kind of everything removed in front of it. And we see this transverse mesocolon keeping everything kind of together with the sigmoid mesocolon, the mesentery. Those are all connective tissues which allow blood vessels to travel through them and just to kind of keep the large intestine um, where it should be. And this is a sagittal view showing where everything is located um, in the abdominal cavity. Then appendicitis, I do ask you a couple questions about appendicitis and what happens with a ruptured appendix. Um, this is an acute inflammation of the appendix. It usually re results from some sort of blockage by a feces that traps infectious bacteria. It can be most common in adolescence when the entrance to the appendix is at the widest. Um, venous drainage can also be impaired, le leading to ischemia and necrosis. And a ruptured appendix can cause peritonitis. And this is bad because peritonitis is an inflammation of the abdominal cavity itself where the appendix sits. So when that appendix bursts, it will cause inflammation of everything around it. Symptoms can be pain in the umbilical region. Moving to the lower right abdominal quadrant, you could have a loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, and the treatment is usually an appendectomy which is surgical remover, removal of the appendix, or in some cases you can treat it with antibiotics, but most often they'll just take it out. Uh, bacterial flora, um, so there's about a thousand different types of bacterial flora in the large intestine. They enter from the small intestine or the anus to colonize the colon, and they have a metabolic function to help fermentation, so they help to ferment indigestible carbohydrates and mucin, and as well as releasing irritating acids and gases. Um, in terms of the large intestine and digestion, residue will remain in your large intestine about 12 to 24 hours. So if you're keeping track about every 24 hours, you should have a bowel movement to get rid of excess indigestible feces. There's no food breakdown occurring in the large intestine, except what uh, some bacteria will digest. But for the most part, there's no food breakdown. You have vitamins, water, and electrolytes that are reclaimed or reabsorbed back into the body. But the major functions of the large intestine are just the propel propulsion of feces to the anus, defecation, and then absorbing a lot of excess water, vitamins, and electrolytes. A little bit of physiology of digestion and absorption then. So we'll go a little bit through kind of how each individual module molecule is digested and broken down into its smaller parts. Digestion in itself breaks down ingested foods into their chemical building blocks. And only these molecules will be small enough to be absorbed across the wall of the intestine. So it's really important to break down everything we eat into small enough compartments that can be absorbed across the intestinal wall and into the bloodstream. So digestion is what we call a catabolic process. And you should know this definition. I didn't highlight it, I forgot to do that. It breaks down macromolecules into monomers or one single molecule. So for example, it breaks down a polysaccharide into a simple sugar or a monosaccharide. You have intrinsic and accessory gland enzymes that are involved in digestion and enzymes carry out what we call hydrolysis, where water is added to specifically break chemical bonds to break up these macromolecules. 
Absorption then is moving substances from the lumen of the gut into the body, into the circulatory system. Tight junctions ensure that molecules must, through must pass through epithelial cells and lipid molecules can be absorbed passively, but large polar molecules are absorbed through active transport. So this requires usually energy, another part in the body that requires ATP. Most nutrients are absorbed before the chyme reaches the ileum, and the ileum is the last part of your small intestine. So here's a look at how structures get absorbed in the small intestine because the epithelial cells have nice tight junctions. The nutrients and anything else absorbed will go right through the epithelial cell and get absorbed into the capillary, which again, the capillary takes everything to the liver for processing and, and um, detoxifying. So in terms of digestion of carbohydrates, only monosaccharides can be absorbed, which is a simple sugar. Starch and disaccharides are broken down to oligo and disaccharides, and this begins in the mouth with salivary amylase, and they're further broken down eventually into a monosaccharide or a simple sugar. So this takes you through carbohydrate digestion. The steps of starch digestion in the intestine include these steps. You don't need to know all these steps, but in general, I want you to know simply um, basic information about just carbohydrates and how they're digested into simple sugars, starting with the mouth with salivary amylase. So here's a look. These are the steps of carbohydrate digestion in the small intestine. Again, you don't need to know the exact steps of all, but just a general understanding of how carbohydrates get broken down into simple sugars. Um, they will require ATP or active transport to be transported into the capillaries. Someone with a lactose intolerance has deficient amounts of lactase and cannot consume lactose, which is often found in milk, cheeses, not eggs. Any lactose eaten will remain undigested and creates an osmotic gradient in the intestine that can actually prevent water from being absorbed. And this can result in diarrhea, and it can also pull water from the interstitial space into the intestinal lumen, which can make everything more watery. It is not pleasant. Um, so if you are lactose intolerant, I feel for you, there are things you can take um, like a lactose enzyme drop to milk or take a lactase tablet before consuming milk products. Um, but it can result in bloating, flatulence, cramping pain. It just, it's very unpleasant. Then protein digestion. Um, the source of protein not only is dietary, but also includes digestive enzymes and proteins from the breakdown of mucosal cells, proteins are broken down in eventually into their amino acid components. And digestion begins in the stomach because when pepsinogen is converted to pepsin, um, because pepsin will be active at a really low pH and pepsin is what will help digest proteins. So here's protein digestion. Pepsin helps with the digestion of proteins. It becomes active in the presence of acid and pepsin will become deactive when it gets to the small intestine. So here's the digestion of proteins and different proteases that help to cleave and cut proteins into smaller and smaller pieces. You don't need to know all of them, but these are the steps involved in protein digestion. The digestion of lipids, we talk about emulsification, which I do want you to know. Emulsification is when triglycerides and their breakdown products they're insoluble in water, meaning they cannot dissolve in water. So they need to be kind of pre-treated with these bile salts that will break large fat globules down into smaller ones. Pancreatic lipases will break them down further into a monoglyceride plus a fatty acid. A missile will form where products from digestion become coated with bile salts and a, um, a product called lectin. And then they'll be able to diffuse and cross the epithelial membrane via diffusion. They eventually become what we call a chylomicron. And chylomicrons will be transported directly into the lymphatic lacteals where they are absorbed. And then they'll eventually be dumped into the venous blood. Um, once in the blood, chylomicrons will then be further broken down and short chain fatty acids can diffuse directly into the blood. So that's the uh, process of fat digestion and absorption. And this looks at what emulsification is. The fat is emulsified, so bile salts surround it. Fat droplets are coated with bile salts, a missile forms, chylomicrons form, which are then able to transfer across the epithelial cell 
and into the green lacteal, which is part of the lymphatic system, your lymphatic system, the lacteals, will transport fat eventually back to venous drainage. Nucleic acid, so nuclei of ingested cells will contain DNA and RNA, so we'll have different enzymes, nucleases, we'll break them apart, and they will be actively transported by special carriers in the epithelium of the villi, and these this shown here, how we break apart the nucleic acids. Vitamin absorption, fat-soluble vitamins are carried by missiles because they're fatty. Water-soluble vitamins can be absorbed or diffused or by passive or active transporters. And vitamin B12 will bind with the intrinsic factor and is absorbed by enzocytosis. So we talked a little bit how without intrinsic factor, vitamin B12 cannot be absorbed. And in the large intestine, vitamins B and K are from bacterial metabolism. They will be absorbed there. Electrolytes are absorbed. They're usually transported actively in the small intestine. Different um, electrolytes are absorbed throughout the small intestine as shown there. Absorption of water, about nine liters of water enters the small intestine and about 95% of it is absorbed in the small intestine and the rest is absorbed in the large intestine. Water uptake is also always coupled with solute uptake. So what that means when water is reabsorbed, usually um, a sodium or potassium follows it as well. If we have malabsorption, this can be caused by anything that interferes with the delivery of bile or pancreatic juice. Um, it could be caused by damaged intestinal mucosa from a bacteria or even antibiotics. We can have celiac disease where you're gluten sensitive. This is a common malabsorption disease where it's basically an immune reaction to gluten, where gluten causes immune cell damage to intestinal villi and the brush border. So some people have to eliminate their gluten from their diet. And that gets us through the digestive system. Thanks for listening, guys. And we will see you next week for the next couple of chapters. So keep up the great work. Only a couple of weeks left of class. You're doing